Markets close out the week on another record high. The president heads to Camp David on the day a tell-all book on his administration hits store shelves. And Hillary Clinton is back in the crosshairs of a federal investigation. This is Special Report. Good evening, welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. Even with all the focus here on an explosive new book on the Trump administration, fueled in part by the president's reaction to it, Wall Street is taking a blind eye to all of the drama. Markets closed out the day at an all-time high again for the third time in this shortened trading week. The U.S. economy also added 148,000 jobs last month, keeping unemployment at 4.1 percent. The Dow hitting... Uh, closing up, rather, more than 220 points today. The S&P 500 was up 19. The Nasdaq gained 59 points. Again, record highs. Fox Business Network's Deirdre Bolton joins us again live with a look at the gains in the shadow of this, these blistering descriptions of the president and his administration. Good evening, Deirdre. Good evening, Brett. That is right. Investors are only focused on stock gains. If you take a look, they are off to their strongest start to a year since 2013. So the Dow extending its record. You showed those numbers up better than 1.5%. S&P 500 is set to post four fresh records in four consecutive weekly trading sessions. So tech stocks, they are one of the best performing groups this week. Now, one of the reasons that investors are optimistic, you alluded to it, a strong labor market. So this morning, the labor market, the data that we got showed unemployment at a 17-year low, 4.1 percent rate, and the pace of hiring did slow. So fewer jobs were added to the U.S. economy than some economists had forecast. But overall, 2017 was one of the best job growth years on on record, and for the Trump administration, it is a welcome bright spot. So if you look at the jobs added, 1.84, that's February through December, but in fact, that is the best number that we've seen as far as the yearly numbers go in a president's first year since President Clinton's first term. Now, for African Americans, there was another bright spot in the data. Unemployment is at its lowest level since at least the early 1970s when the government began tracking the data. So December 2017, unemployment for African Americans came in at 6.8 percent. That's a 45-year low. Overall, biggest job gains in the month, that is to say December, they were in healthcare, construction, and manufacturing. Surprisingly, 20,000 jobs were lost in retail. I say surprising because the retail season in 2017 was great. It was the best that it had been in more than a few years' time. But the focus, Brett, of course, always on the future. Macy's announcing it is cutting 5,000 jobs as it closes 11 stores this year. In the meantime, though, markets in the green. Back to you. Deirdre, thank you. Well, after a wild week of insults, accusations, jaw-dropping quotes, and legal threats, President Trump is now out of Washington tonight trying to turn the page on this new book that portrays him as isolated and ridiculed by members of his own staff, who the author of this book quotes as describing the president being unfit for the job. After aggressive pushback, calling the book phony, President Trump left the White House bound for Camp David to focus on the legislative agenda ahead. Before leaving, though, he fired off a couple of tweets attacking his former chief strategist, quoted in the book, and Michael Wolff, the author of that book, who spoke out for the first time today. Correspondent Kevin Cork has the story live from the North Lawn. Good evening, Kevin. Evening, Brett. You're right. The president leaving Washington en route to Camp David uh, for that working weekend uh, this afternoon. That's about 56 miles away from where we are right here. But despite that distance, as you point out, the president has been unable to distance himself from the ongoing controversy surrounding that new tell-all book about the Trump White House. <laughs> President Trump ignored shouted questions about Steve Bannon today, but had plenty to say about him online, giving his former chief strategist the nickname Sloppy Steve in a pair of tweets. The controversial tell-all book is still front and center in the president's mind. Earlier, he took issue with its author, Michael Wolf, and his claim that the two had talked, tweeting zero access to White House and never spoke to him for book. Despite repeated denials by the White House, Wolf said today he talked to the president at length. I've spent about uh, three hours with the president over the course of the campaign and in the White House. So my window into Donald Trump is um, 
um, is pretty significant. But even more to the point, I spent this, I spent, and this was really the sort of the point of the book, I spoke to people who spoke to the president on a daily, sometimes minute by minute basis. We are sold out. We'll have more copies early next week. The book went on sale overnight. Four days ahead of schedule due to demand, according to its publisher, and quickly shot up to the top of Amazon's bestseller list. Among Wolf's assertions, the president thought former FBI Director Jim Comey was, quote, a rat, that his reaction to every problem is to fire someone right away, that some White House staffers thought the president might be dyslexic, and that senior staffers often thought he acted, quote, like a child. Wolf admits parts of the book are merely his recollections of events and conversations, something White House officials point to as proof that the book is simply made up. He repeatedly begged to speak with the president and was denied access, and he makes it sound uh, like he was sitting outside the Oval Office every single day, which is just not the case. Uh, this is a guy who made up a lot of stories to try to sell books, uh, and I think more and more people are starting to see uh, that his facts just simply don't add up. We're going to Camp David with a lot of the great Republican senators, and we're making America great again. The president's weekend will be dominated by a myriad of meetings at Camp David with his cabinet and with GOP congressional lawmakers as the administration looks to map out its agenda for 2018, including a plan to head off a possible budget crisis, infrastructure and welfare reform, funding for the military, DACA, and funding for the wall. Speaking of Camp David, Chief Economic Advisor Gary Cohn says officials will likely, Brett, decide between infrastructure and welfare form as the next big project they tackle. Back to you. Kevin Cork, live on the North Lawn. Kevin, thank you. Investigations abound. Hillary Clinton under federal investigation over possible pay-to-play politics during her time as Secretary of State. This has Republican senators refer the author of the so-called Trump dossier for criminal investigation. And tonight we're learning there were more than one, there was more than one White House official asking Attorney General Jeff Sessions to stay on the Russia case and not to recuse himself as he did. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harris is following all of these developments, joins us with the latest. Good evening, Catherine. Well, thank you, Brett. In a series of phone calls, more than one White House official lobbied the Attorney General, discouraging his recusal from the Russia case. Sources familiar with the discussion said White House Counsel Don McGahn, former Press Secretary Sean Spicer, and former Chief of Staff Rance Priebus all spoke with Sessions as pressure mounted on the Attorney general after his meeting with the Russian ambassador came to light. Contacted by Fox, Spicer denied it, and we are in the process of reaching out to Priebus for comment. A separate source said the president was deeply frustrated with Sessions because while under consideration for attorney general, Sessions gave no indication he would recuse himself. Lawmakers have pressed the attorney general on the issues. Has the president ever expressed his frustration to you regarding your decision to recuse yourself? Uh, Senator Heinrich, I'm not um, able to share uh, with this committee private communications. Because you're invoking executive privilege. I'm not able to invoke executive privilege. That's the president's uh, prerogative. In a separate development today, senior Senate Republicans Chuck Grassley and Lindsey Graham referred the former British spy Christopher Steele, who combined, compiled the Trump dossier to the Justice Department for criminal prosecution. The senators accused Steele of lying about the dossier's distribution, which included American reporters. A senior Senate Democrat said the referral is deeply partisan, Brett. Uh, Catherine, you first reported last January the Clinton Foundation was under investigation, and now we are hearing from U.S. officials that those pay-to-play allegations are getting a second look. Well, that's right. A source tells Fox News the Justice Department is investigating allegations the Clinton Foundation used pay-to-play tactics when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. We're told this investigation is led by the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI in Little Rock, Arkansas, and they are considering whether the foundation violated tax law. We also understand multiple witnesses have been interviewed. The White House Press Secretary told Fox today the investigation is justified. There's certainly been a lot of information out there that I think gives all of us cause for concern, and I think it's important that they're finally taking a look at it. A Clinton spokesman responded time after time the Clinton Foundation has been subjected to politically motivated allegations, and time after time these allegations have been proven false. None of this has made us waver in our mission to help people. Brett. And just to be clear, this is separate from what we understand to be another look at the email investigation. That's correct.
Okay, Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. The Trump administration is ramping up pressure on Venezuela, imposing sanctions on four of the country's military officials today. The move freezes any assets they have under U.S. jurisdiction. The sanctions add to dozens of current and former Venezuelan officials the U.S. has already targeted and economic sanctions at a time when the South American nation is trying to refinance a huge international debt. The Trump administration also took its toughest stance yet against Pakistan, cutting close to $2 billion in aid to the country over what the president calls, quote, lies and deceit about terrorism. Words that Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S. tells Fox News do not sit well with his country. Correspondent Rich Edson with the report tonight from the State Department. The Trump administration has for months expressed its immense frustration with Pakistan and its failure to address terrorist sanctuaries within its borders. That's according to a senior State Department official. Though in an exclusive interview with Fox News today, Pakistan's ambassador to the United States says President Trump's New Year's Day tweet and its accusation were a surprise and that a senior White House official only informed Pakistan Wednesday the administration would suspend additional U.S. aid. This kind of uh, statements of this sort um, have not been received well in Pakistan because Pakistan thought that we are the friend and ally of the United States. When you hear uh, the words like lies and deceit, uh, that somehow, um, I think, uh, was, did not go down well with the people of Pakistan. Senior officials say Pakistan provides sanctuaries to terrorist organizations that launch attacks in Afghanistan. They have to take decisive action. They have to take decisive steps. A senior U.S. official says the administration is with holding a sum total of about $2 billion from Pakistan. The State Department says Pakistan can earn that money by addressing these concerns. The U.S. has previously withheld funding. Pakistan has previously blocked U.S. access to transportation routes. As to whether Pakistan may retaliate, the ambassador says his country wants to avoid a confrontation with the United States. If, um, you know, the United States takes this step and Pakistan then takes another step and, you know, uh, then the two countries will drift apart. And I don't think that is in the interest of either country. We do hope that uh, uh, we will not have more of these statements because we don't want these two countries to drift uh, further apart. Ambassador Chaudhry says his country has addressed terrorism in Pakistan, and he says he's requested a meeting with Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. It is unclear when or if that will happen. The State Department will only say it has no meetings to announce. Brett? Rich Edson at the State Department. Rich, thanks. The United Nations Security Council held an emergency meeting this afternoon about the recent protests in Iran. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley is calling for support of those protests, but others there at the U.N. are calling the meeting itself an overreach by the U.S. Correspondent Benjamin Hall reports. Nine days in, and anti-government protests continue, despite attempts by the regime to overshadow them. For three days, Iran has held counter-rallies, showing tens of thousands of people supporting the government. It's thought many are bust in. And at Friday, prayers to chants of death to America and Israel, leading hardline cleric Ahmed Khatami again blamed the U.S. Those who got involved in the protests and still insist on their positions, they are Americans. Show no mercy to Americans. At the emergency U.N. Security Council meeting, Nikki Haley again stood by the protesters. And let there be no doubt whatsoever, the United States stands unapologetically with those in Iran who seek freedom for themselves, prosperity for their families, and dignity for their nation. The U.S. has also imposed new sanctions on five Iranian companies linked to the country's ballistic missile program, though some have called for more. Severe financial sanctions, including denying access to international banking system, must be imposed on the regime. The protests are now the most serious internal crisis the regime has faced in almost a decade. 21 people are dead and many hundreds arrested. The opposition have long complained the regime prioritizes weapons over its people. Any funding that comes to their hand, example the nuclear deal, is not going to spend on people who are starving on the streets. This is a new wave of protesters, poor and mainly under 25, angry at the regime's corruption. 
Crucially, they come from the regime's traditional rural strongholds. Many look abroad for support. Today, the world stands in support of the Iranian people, particularly uh, free, uh, Western democracies, the United States of America included. That will send a very clear message that we are no longer going to fall into the same trappings that this regime has set for all of us all these years. It's hard to know what happens next, whether the protests continue or if they peter out. But many feel that something major has shifted, and either way, the Iranian regime is starting to crack. Brett? Benjamin Hall in London. Benjamin, thank you. After the bomb cyclone comes the big dig. Digging out from snow and ice buildup, but bone-chilling temps will not make that easy. That store is next. The storm may be over, but winter's wrath is still being felt across the Northeast as frigid temperatures and gusty winds are making recovery from that storm all the more difficult and dangerous tonight. Correspondent Brian Yenis has the story from Boston. Predicted to be a meteorological phenomenon called a bomb cyclone, the first major storm of 2018 lived up to its name. In Massachusetts, at least 32 coastal communities experienced significant flooding. This is Winthrop, submerged in icy salt water. In Marshfield, the National Guard rescued at least six residents from flooded homes and vehicles submerged in the icy slush. He put me over his shoulders and put me in the car. Surveying the damage in situate today, Governor Charlie Baker thanks Stefan Hall for for rescuing the harbor master who slipped off a dock into the ocean midstorm while trying to tie down a boat. I saw him and I said, you know, I don't have much time. I can't hold on much longer. Back in Boston, the city is recovering after the highest tide ever recorded pushed about two feet of water into downtown areas, flooding a subway station and roads where there was at least one water rescue. Chris Nolan, owner of Boston Harbor Cruises, was inside his office during the storm when about a foot and a half of ocean water inundated the street. His employees took turns holding the door shut. Still, eight inches of water destroyed their office. I've never seen the water get this high. Now the Midwest and the East Coast brace for an Arctic blast plummeting temperatures Sunday morning to a low of minus two in Pittsburgh and zero in Philadelphia. In New York City, sub-zero temperatures have hurt the cleanup. The mayor warning residents to be careful of icy roads and sidewalks. More than 1,700 flights were canceled Friday because of the storm. At LaGuardia, Eddie has been sleeping in the airport since 6 p.m. Thursday night. So we're like, okay, we'll stay here, try to see if we can catch a standby and see if they can help us out in the morning and actually they did they got us a flight for tonight a wind chill advisory is in effect for much of the northeast and midwest this weekend temperatures expected to dip a minus 14 in cleveland a minus 33 wind chill in upstate new york and 20 below zero in boston the type of temperatures that can cause frostbite in less than 10 minutes brett Time is almost up, Brian. Get inside. Thanks. West Coast governors are promising to do whatever it takes to stop the Trump administration's proposal to allow new drilling in the waters off the Pacific, despite promises of new jobs and energy independence. National correspondent William Lajeunesse reports on the battle ahead from Los Angeles. We need to know the facts before we allow deep water drilling to continue. The Deepwater Horizon spill prompted President Obama to rescind plans to open parts of the Gulf and the Atlantic to drilling. I've issued a six month moratorium on deep water drilling. That six months became seven years, and on Thursday, President Trump torpedoed that legacy. This is a dramatic departure from previous policy. Overturning 33 years of policy, the Trump plan opens both coasts to drilling. Under President Trump, we're going to have the strongest energy policy and become the strongest energy superpower. To achieve that, the administration wants to open 47 new areas for leasing. Each block represents thousands of acres. If approved, companies can explore and potentially drill for oil and gas. We have currently 94% of our offshore resources off limits, and this is an opportunity to open up more of those areas to supply growing demand. We already um, have efforts on the ground to oppose it here in the state of California. Environmentalists promise to fight any drilling proposal. 
as do Western governors who accuse the president of ignoring climate change and the risk to wildlife. We are in and united in our opposition to this move by the president. The threat of lawsuits is one reason major companies are reluctant to change long-term drilling plans. They also fear a future administration may flip Trump's decision. Federal waters extend three to 200 miles off the coast, offering political and economic challenges. But the real answers may lie beneath, where seismic testing can show how much oil exists and if it's worth drilling for. Every administration must issue a five-year plan for the nation's offshore resources. This one begins in 2019. Till then, public hearings will weed out unrealistic leases, though rising gas prices could change the economics and the politics of what happens next. Brett? William, thank you. A little telephone diplomacy for two former rivals. White House officials say President Trump spoke to Mitt Romney briefly last night. The two apparently spoke about Utah Senator Orrin Hatch's retirement. Hatch and his departure opens the door for Romney, who has been a frequent critic, of course, of President Trump in the past. He could possibly run for this seat. Up next, how the city of Detroit is managing four years after declaring bankruptcy in our Whatever Happened To segment. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 32 in Orlando, where Florida Congressman Ron DeSantis is making it official, filing paperwork to run for governor of the state. Last month, President Trump announced his support for DeSantis in a tweet saying the congressman would make a great governor of Florida. Fox 5 in Atlanta, where they're seeing a lot of red and black today after the governor declared it UGA Football Friday. Georgia residents encouraged to wear the university's colors in support of the Georgia Bulldogs who take on Alabama for the national championship Monday night in Atlanta. And this is a live look at Los Angeles from our affiliate Fox 11. One of the big stories out there tonight, the production of Jeopardy is on pause after host Alex Trebek underwent unexpected brain surgery last month. Trebek underwent the surgery to remove blood clots from his brain in mid-December. He told fans his prognosis is excellent and expects to be back at work very soon. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. Four years ago, the city of Detroit filed the largest municipal bankruptcy in U.S. history. At the time, the city couldn't pay its bills, couldn't meet payroll, couldn't even keep the lights on. Since then, the Motor City has undergone a major transformation. In our continuing series, Whatever Happened to Correspondent Matt Finn talks to Detroit's mayor about how the Motor City is faring. Despite Detroit's questionable reputation, this is what the downtown looks like today. You feel safe. It's just vibrant down here. Detroit now is alive. How would you describe it growing up? Just sort of a place my parents said not to go. <laughs> How would you describe it now? Uh, a place where I was here with my parents last weekend. <laughs> it was just four years ago in 2013 when Detroit filed the largest municipal bankruptcy in American history. For decades, it just seemed like everything was taken away from us. Uh, you know, businesses moved out, auto plants moved out, gas stations and movie theaters moved out, and people moved out. Today, Detroit still has an estimated $11 billion in debt. Some city employees will never receive their full pension, and Detroit sold off some prized properties to creditors. But Motor City is in the midst of a notable comeback. This is emotionally very powerful to see crowds on the street shopping on the weekends, uh, to see the nightlife again, to see people moving back into the city is very exciting. 25,000 jobs have been added downtown. Some corporate offices are at 101% occupancy. Detroiters are quick to give credit to Quicken Loans for playing the biggest role in Detroit's comeback. Founder Dan Gilbert relocated the company from the suburbs to downtown and now employs 18,000 people. He has changed the downtown economy like nobody else in seven years. And since Mayor Mike Duggan took office in 2014, the city has demolished nearly 14,000 of its infamous dilapidated properties. At one point, the city was so broke, the street lights were out. Today, the lights are back on and basic services are functioning again. The buses run on time, the garbage is being picked up, blights being removed, street lights are on. Perhaps the city's most successful method of eliminating blight is the Detroit Land Bank program. 
Property owners can purchase abandoned side lots attached to theirs for $100 if they agree to rehab or occupy it within six months. The program also auctions off homes for $100 to $100,000. The proceeds go towards funding the operation of the land bank program to restore the city. Downtown Detroit undoubtedly in the midst of a historic comeback, but there are more than 100 square miles outside of the city center where many people are still living in Detroit's historic blight. And the mayor says it's his number one goal to fix that. So far, the city has sold more than 8,000 side lots for 100 bucks and sold off more than 4,000 dilapidated homes. Brett. Matt Finn in Detroit. Matt, thanks. Moving overseas now, Saudi Defense Forces say they intercepted a ballistic missile fired uh, at Nadron from uh, Yemen's Houthi rebels. The re rebels said uh, it hit their target, but the Saudi-led coalition said there was just minor damage to someone's property after the Saudis destroyed the missile. The Saudis, with the support of the U.S., have launched more than 15,000 air attacks against Houthi targets since March of 2015, while dozens of missiles have been fired into the Saudi kingdom from Yemen. North and South Korea have agreed to hold their first talks in more than two years next Tuesday. South Korea's unification ministry says North Korea accepted their offer to meet to discuss cooperation during next month's Winter Olympics in Seoul and overall ties. The announcement came just hours after the Trump administration agreed to delay joint military exercises with South Korea until after the Olympics. Chinese officials are applauding the talks, even as the country tightened limits on oil supplies and other trade to North Korea under pressure from U.N. nuclear sanctions. China's president met with his military this week, as various reports show that country continuing to build up its force. And what some believe may be a warning to the U.S. and maybe a response to the Trump administration's America First policy. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin reports from the Pentagon on the possibility of a new Cold War with China. To mark the new year, China's president this week oversaw a mobilization ceremony at a military base 100 miles outside Beijing, where he urged China's rapidly expanding military to train harder and faster to win the next war. Calling on the whole armed forces to comprehensively strengthen real combat training. Last year, China opened its first overseas military base in Djibouti, right next to a U.S. drone base. Now China appears to be building a large naval base and airport in Pakistan, as the U.S. cuts aid to Pakistan to punish it for supporting the Taliban. The next Cold War may already be underway, and China could have the upper hand, according to a new series of warnings from top Chinese experts. In a list of 2018's top risks, Ian Bremmer of the Eurasia Group warns President Xi, quote, benefits from lucky timing. Trump has renounced the U.S. commitment to Washington-led multilateralism and generated much uncertainty about the future U.S. role in Asia, creating a power vacuum that China can now begin to fill. The Center for New American Security predicts China's Navy will be bigger than the U.S. Navy in 2030. China has newfound capabilities and it has newfound assertiveness and confidence. Anywhere it finds an opportunity, it is jumping in headlong. And whether that's a base in Djibouti in Africa and now a base in Gwadar in Pakistan. China is increasing its foreign aid, building bridges and roads all over Africa and Asia. On his third day in office, President Trump pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is an opportunity. There's disruption going on in America. There's a pullback. The America First is not going to be appealing to this region. America's retreating. Last June, the Pentagon warned China would establish military bases in countries which had been friendly to the U.S. Today, I asked Defense Secretary Mattis if he was worried China would fill the void in Pakistan, and he said no. Brett? Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you. Up next, from the Russia to the Hillary Clinton investigations, our panel weighs in on all the developments involving the Attorney General and the Trump Justice Department. Senator Jeff Sessions, you love Jeff Sessions. He's doing a good job. We have been weakened in our investigation into very important concerns at the Department of Justice and at the FBI 
because Jeff Sessions isn't able to take the reins and to direct that investigation. I believe it may be time for him to step aside. Right now, uh, he's focused on doing his job. We're focused on doing ours. Uh, we don't have any reason to see that there's anything different uh, today than there was yesterday. Talking there about the Attorney General, uh, Jeff Sessions, under fire from some lawmakers about how he's handled investigations, the Justice Department, the FBI. Now, the White House lawyer, Don McGahn, is coming under some scrutiny after a New York Times story, obstruction inquiry shows Trump's struggle to keep grip on Russia investigation. President Trump, quote, gave firm instructions in March to the White House's top lawyer, stop the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, from recusing himself in the Justice Department's investigation into whether Trump's associates had helped a Russian campaign to disrupt the 2016 election. Mr. McGahn was unsuccessful, and the president erupted in anger in front of numerous White House officials, saying he needed his Attorney General to protect him. Mr. Trump said he had expected his top law enforcement official to safeguard him the way he believed Robert F. Kennedy as Attorney General had done for his his brother John F. Kennedy and Eric Holder had for Barack Obama, continuing with this story. So what about this development, the Russia investigation, and we'll talk about the other investigations that now the Justice Department is involved in. Let's bring in our panel. Byron York, Chief Political Correspondent of The Washington Examiner, A.B. Stoddard, Associate Editor at Real Clear Politics and host of No Labels Radio on Sirius XM, and Matt Schlapp, contributor with The Hill. Okay, Byron, let's start with uh, the story and We've confirmed that they, they, there was an effort, not only McGahn, but other officials asking Sessions not to recuse himself in the Russian investigation, which he eventually did. Well, the other officials is important because there were a bunch of people telling Jeff Sessions, don't do it, don't recuse, uh, the Democrats are trying to push you into this, this is a bad uh, idea. And I would suppose that Jeff Sessions gets points for standing up to the whatever pressure this was. Not with President uh, Trump. Uh, well, not with President Trump. But, but he did defy the president's wishes here by going ahead and recusing, rec recusing himself because he had gotten a lot of advice, not just from the career people in the Justice Department, but also other people that he trusted in the legal world, uh, that he had to do this. I, I don't think this is a huge deal. Uh, the other thing in the New York Times story uh, about Sessions was that it suggested that an aide to Sessions had gone to Capitol Hill looking for dirt on Jim Comey. That was the weakest part of the story and it's the one the Justice Department very, very specifically said did not happen. But what, you know, we obviously have all the things that came out and have come out in this book, this new book, uh, and among them some new uh, eyebrow-raising uh, allegations about possible obstruction that people are looking into about Air Force One, and yeah, we talked about that last night on the panel. But, A.B., what about the White House attorney, his role, and is this a problem for McGahn? Um, once again, McGahn was taking orders from his boss, his principal, and doing what um, everyone around Donald Trump does, which is to to um, follow instructions. Uh, the president, as we know, because he's been very public about this, felt very strongly about this and believes that it is the role of uh, congressional Republicans, as he told Mitch McConnell, to protect him. That's why he wanted the Russia probes on the Hill curtailed. And it was the role of the attorney general to protect him. I don't know how much exposure Dan, Don McGahn has as a re result of this, but what's very concerning, I think, is that you see a real campaign now to bring down Jeff Sessions. It is no longer the president of the United States. It is many members on Capitol Hill, Congressman's Meadow and Jordan, Meadows and Jordan's writing in the Washington Examiner uh, yesterday that because he allows leaks, he's not in control. Um, it, is be it is because of what he cannot do, because of the recusal, that they say he's failing at his job. It's really an unbelievable allegation. He did what he thought was the right thing to avoid the, any appearance of impropriety. And as a result, they want someone in there that will stick it to Rod Rosenstein or Bob Mueller and operate those probes the way that the president wants them operated. It is quite something to see the turn here. Remember, Sessions was one of the first, if not the first, uh, he was the first senator, but lawmaker, to endorse mm -hmm. Donald Trump. Uh, he stood up for him in the darkest of hours right. after the Access Hollywood tape came out. I interviewed him that night. Um, and now this has all turned. Right. I think the biggest problem Jeff Sessions has had in this long, long year is that he picked a career uh, number two as the deputy attorney general. 
Now, why is that an issue? That's an issue because when he recused himself, he recused the investigation over to somebody who was, let's just say, awfully damn cautious about each one of these questions on not only how you manage the FBI, and it is their job to manage the FBI, but all these other questions and investigations. Now we find out a year later that they're starting to take some sure-footed steps on the investigations on the clear wrongdoing of Hillary Clinton. And the second question here is Don McGahn, and I, I want to say this aggressively. I am not a lawyer. I talked to lawyers who served in the White House Counsel's Office for the President I worked for. They believe that Don McGahn acted a hundred percent correctly, that they would have done exactly the same thing, Brett. It is their job as, as the White House lawyer, as the, as the counsel to the president, to make the legal case to the attorney general about why you don't have to recuse. Now, the only cor correction I would make is that Sessions had already gone to the internal lawyers and already gotten guidance that he needed to recuse himself. So what Don did was exactly right. And when, when he realized Sessions had already gotten that guidance, he pulled back. So he's acted completely appropriately, and I think the New York Times story is completely off. And sources are saying that he talked about a whole bunch of things, including that recusal. I want to turn to what you mentioned, the Clinton investigation, and obviously the president's talked about that a lot. She engaged in corrupt pay-for-play at the State Department for personal enrichment. She lied to the FBI, and she lied to the American people many, many times. Look, I think that's good news. Uh, certainly, I think there have been a lot of things that give us cause for concern, and I think it's a great thing that, that it's being looked at. Uh, and we'll have to wait and see what happens, but there's certainly been a lot of information out there that I think gives all of us cause for concern, and I think it's important that they're finally taking a look at it, and, and we'll, see, we'll see what comes from it. I have not seen any evidence uh, to conclude that those allegations are accurate, uh, so it should be pursued. And here's a statement from the Clinton camp, uh, Nick Merrill. Let's call it what it is, a sham. This is a philanthropy about the Clinton Foundation that does life-changing work, which Republicans have tried to turn into a political football. It began with a long debunked project spearheaded by Steve Bannon during the presidential campaign. It continues with Jeff Sessions doing Trump's bidding by heeding his calls to meddle with a department that's supposed to function independently. The goal is to distract from the indictments, guilty pleas, and accusations of treason from Trump's own people at the expense of our justice system's intent. Integrity. It's disgraceful, disgraceful and should be concerning to all Americans. Byron, we should point out it's not only now the Clinton Foundation, which was an investigation, now is getting a second look, but obviously the email situation is also getting a fresh look. Yeah, that's, that's right. You know, I would not absolutely assume that the Clinton Foundation investigation was closed and over. Back in November, Stephen Boyd, a top Justice Department official, when the House lawmakers that you were talking about, who were putting pressure on Sessions, they want him to appoint some special counsels, Stephen Boyd writes to the House Judiciary Committee and said, okay, we're gonna, we'll take a look at this and we will include looking at whether any matters currently under investigation require further resources. It could be that that uh, uh, foundation investigation has been going on quietly the whole time. FBI office in Arkansas and New York uh, were told new interviews in recent weeks. Next up, the Friday lightning round. In 2009, the world stood by passively while the hopes of the Iranian people were crushed by their government. In 2018, we will not be silent. If the founding principles of this institution mean anything, we will not only hear their cry, we will finally answer it. The Iranian regime is now on notice. The world will be watching what you do. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley at a U.N. Security Council meeting this afternoon uh, called to talk about those protests that are ongoing in Iran. Uh, what about this and where is it headed? We're back with our panel. Uh, Matt. You know, I just think that this is an indictment of the Iranian policy and obviously the Iran nuclear deal that Obama wanted to be his legacy of his second term. We turned over hundreds of billions of dollars in assets that had been frozen. And where is that money gone? The Obama administration promised us that it would better the lives of the Iranian people. The Iranian people 
up and down society have taken to the streets because their lives have actually gotten worse, not better. And where did that money go? It's going to eventually build nuclear weapons, increase their missile launch technology, and it's going to the pockets of terrorists. This is a disaster. And if there's anything that is uh, uh, that a legacy of the Obama administration in a negative way, it is this deal. I forgot to mention, this is the lightning round. A uh, AB. Yeah, uh, AB. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, it's uh, you saw the president this week say he'll, there'll be a, more of a response at the appropriate time. He said what that is really matters. And as he is dealing with a nuclear standoff with the North Koreans, the idea of him trying to push for regime change in Iran right now um, is a volatile and, and really uh, challenging one. So it's really the onus is on him not just to watch the protesters and praise them, but to actually put uh, words into deeds. And that's going to be really difficult. And there are some things they could do with telecommunications they can open up just make sure that uh, companies can do all they can to provide internet service for example yeah and this meeting today uh, and and Haley's speech that you just played I mean that was a good thing to get the United States again on the right side of the situation and show other countries the Russians or even the French not on the right side of the situation you have to clarify these issues on a, on a world stage and that's what she did all right uh, winners and losers winner first Byron Devin Nunes the House Intel Committee chairman who seems to have won his fight to uh, get the FBI to turn over uh, documents about the Trump dossier, at least till they start dragging their feet again. And the loser is Al Franken, who officially left the Senate this week. And I have to say, after his vague announcement uh, a while back, there were some Franken truthers out there, like me, who <laughs> thought he was not actually going to go, and he did. Winner or loser, Abby? Um, my winner is Michael Wolf. I am not endorsing his methodology or his reporting or his findings in the book, but I will say um, he took advantage of a abject failure of judgment of the president who allowed him to pack a duffel bag and move into the White House. As a result of that and the cease and desist order, he is a very wealthy man. Mm -hmm. um, and my loser, um, for all the obvious reasons, is Steve Bannon. But my concern is that, um, forget losing his job at Breitbart and everything else, without his billionaire friends to loan their jets, he might have to fly commercial. <laughs> winner and loser. Uh, General Kelly is my winner. Took a, what is chronicled as too much chaos in the West Wing and cleaned up its act, and he's the winner. I'm trying to be brief. That's good. Loser. <laughs> Loser is Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia, who won an outstanding race to be the new Democratic governor of Virginia, but poor guy, because of the flip of a coin, something like a flip of a coin, will not have a majority in either the uh, House of Delegates or the Senate. So good for the Republicans. There you go, winners and losers. I have a winner tonight. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, talking to reporters at the Pentagon this afternoon, was asked his biggest military concern in 2018. He responded, quote, I don't have concerns, I create them. <laughs> That's the winner of the week as far as a quote. When we come back after a wild week here in Washington, we round up some of the best things said. Tonight may have been a short week for some of us, but it was still filled with news. The first week of 2018 must end with an installment of Notable Quotables. Bill is like, yeah, Bono-Genesis! Furious, disgusted, would probably certainly fit. Did Steve Bannon betray you, Mr. President? There is a new call today to literally stop the presses. Where do I send the box of chocolates? If you want to call yourself ignorant, I'll, I am. I'm but not going to argue. I was telling my mom, like, oh, we'll have people coming out of the woodwork you wouldn't have even expected. One tweet later, one policy later, a complete reversal. I like Jeff Sessions. I just want you to do your job. This little pot dictator bragging that he's got a nuke button on the desk. Well, Trump says, you know what? I got a bigger button than you. He has undermined American standing, American influence. The people of Iran are crying out for freedom. There's no extra money around Washington, but we could quit sending it to countries like Pakistan, which really at best are frenemies. I used to call her in the governor's office the uh, velvet glove. <laughs> velvet hammer. Velvet hammer. Velvet hammer. Yes. Right. So help you God? I do. Uh, I had a slight medical problem, uh, subdural hematoma, blood clots on the brain caused by a fall. They've given us nothing but heartache, culminating in this 0-16 disaster that was this season. Now you're looking at the strongest start of the year for the market since back in 2006. We're off to a very good start. How are you feeling about 2018? Great year. Whew. 
<laughs> Hard to believe, all in one week. And just a note, tonight marks nine years since I took over the show from Britt Hume. Also hard to believe. Thank you for continuing to invite us into your home tonight. That is it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and still unafraid. The story.